All right, thank you. We're uh, beginning our hearing for today, uh, Tuesday, uh, January 19th. Welcome everyone to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, thank you um, to members, of course, and for certainly the public watching us today and for those who will be testifying. Uh, we have a hearing on 14 bills today. Uh, as I uh, will say for the next week or so, please bear with us as we're conducting these hearings with uh, not such a new technology, but trying to do hearings in this new way. Uh, if there's any change in times or any breaks, you will see a note on the screen uh, where my name is will otherwise be. Uh, if you're in the waiting room waiting to testify, please make sure your name matches the name you signed up with. Otherwise, uh, we can't admit you because we don't know who you are. So we can only bring in the people who have signed up. Uh, today, we originally had four tax bills. Uh, one of them, House Bill 177, was withdrawn. So I just want to make sure that no one was planning to listen or testify on that bill. And then after we do the uh, property tax bills on our agenda, we will then move on to the 11 election law bills. So that is our day today. I know that we already have our first uh, delegate here to testify. Delegate Malone, welcome, it's good to see you. Please begin. Good to see you, Madam Chair Chairwoman. I am gonna briefly testify regarding a very simple bill which is enabling, enabling legislation that allows a disabled or uh, fallen law enforcement officer um, to expand that category to include federal investigators and, and which, who are currently not able to possibly receive the local property tax credit. Um, this bill came to me from a constituent, Mark uh, Cicero, um, who, fall, who does fall in this category once again, this is enabling uh, legislation, so it would still need to be approved by the local county. And therefore, the, the, we just received our fiscal note, and it, it does not affect things unless a local county um, further you know, passes the legislation to allow it to come into play. Um, with that said, um, I'd like to hand it off to Mr. Cicero if, he, if someone can tag him for me. Uh, he's in here and he's already unmuted. So go ahead, Mr. Cicero. Thanks for joining us today. No problem. Thank you for hearing me about this issue. So um, coming across, I am a disabled federal agent and I was looking into tax credits to be able to help my salary go a little bit farther and realize that this rule really restricts federal agents because it limits you on, you have to own a house in Maryland at the time of injury, or you have to have lived in Maryland at a, during the time of injury. And federal agents don't exactly live in Maryland um, when our injury occurs. But sometimes, you know, like I'm from here, so I decided to come back and be with my family. So I am trying. was trying to get the tax credit so I could um, make my salary go further. And just to explain, when you are a federal agent and you get disabled, um, you make 70, if you have a dependent, you make 75% of what you made when you were working. So agents start at around $65,000 a year. So just to give you um, a breakdown, that's about, so if they were to be, to be disabled between one and five years of when they start working, they now make $48,750. And um, that agent can, if the doctor does not clear them, that agent cannot go and work to make more money. And so I was trying to, in my particular situation, I was trying to just substitute in my son's school and maybe make four or $5,000 a year just to get out of the house and be able to um, subsidize that income a little bit. Well, if you make $5,000 on say year one of when you're disabled, the federal government says, well, you've proven that you can make $5,000 a year. We're now gonna deduct $5,000 a year from your salary for the rest of your life, if you work or not. So I could be something, else could happen to me and now I'm I'm out you know I'm, I'm now making only forty three thousand dollars a year or if I found a job that I was making twenty thousand dollars a year for one year now I'm only making twenty eight thousand dollars a year and just Maryland is just not that conducive I mean it's just very high real estate as everyone knows um, and with our geographic location I think this would benefit a plethora of people because we are close to DC and the epicenter of the US government so I just was um, hoping you guys take the time and consideration to review this and it would help out so many people that to help their funds go a lot farther. And in, conclu in conclusion, a matter, 
Madam Chairwoman, uh, we would just ask for a favorable report on House Bill 386. Uh, thank you, Delegate Malone. Thank you, Mr. Cicero, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, uh, members, please use the raise hand function. Does anyone, if you have a question, uh, Delegate Barnes with a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Delegate Malone, thank you for the bill. Roughly how many fallen uh, law enforcement officers are there in the state of Maryland? As in like Maryland County Police, State Police, or federal agents? So this is for Delegate Malone. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, be I do believe Mr. Cicero actually has an answer if I may defer to him. Please, and Mr. And that Cicero, go ahead. Federal agents, I mean, I know of, we have a chapter of Baltimore federal agent chapter that has several hundred um, agents within that chapter. And that's not even all the federal agents that um, are in Maryland. Right, so I'm trying to get an idea of, of, of the number throughout the state of Maryland. So you're saying in Baltimore, you estimate that there are a couple of hundred. Uh, what about well, the Baltimore chapter of FLUIA, which is the Federal Law Enforcement Association, has a couple hundred, but that's our that's our chapters in Baltimore. Like I currently live in Edgewater. Okay. But we, um, you know, so they come from all over and they come from all different agencies. IRS has criminal investigators, Homeland Security. I worked for US Army CID, NCIS, Secret Service, FBI. I mean, I could go on and on of the agents, agencies that this would fall. No I think, I think it, Delegate it, Malone, if you were able to, I think what Delegate Barnes is certainly getting to is what number of people could this impact so we have some sense of the uh, uh, fiscal impact to the state? Yeah, from looking at the fiscal note, I would approximately fit 25, but I will try to firm up that number and share it with the committee. Delegate Barnes, any further questions? No, ma'am. All right, anybody else? All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Delegate Malone. Thank you, Mr. Cicero, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank I've, you. Also, uh, I've also provided written testimony that goes into a little bit more detail if you guys would like to review that as well. Thank you and be safe. All right, thank you. Thank you. Off to judiciary. All right, as I mentioned already, uh, the second bill uh, was withdrawn. So moving on to bill number three, uh, Delegate Long, House Bill 252. Thank you, Madam Chair. Still getting used to working like this, like we all are. Um, for the record, Delegate Bob Long, I'm here to testify on behalf of House Bill 252, owner occupant. Uh, residential property. A result of the pandemic, we all know what's happening right now. People are losing their jobs, um, you know, a lot of bad things, unfortunately. Um, I'm getting contact from people that are afraid of losing their property because of tax sale. All this bill does is put a two-year moratorium for tax sales. It's not doesn't mean that the uh, county will not get their property tax that they're due. It just gives a two-year moratorium. Hopefully, we'll be done and over with with this uh, pandemic and everybody gets back to work and our economy picks back up. The last thing we wanna see is a homeowner lose their property to property tax sale. Um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to any information that anybody would like to share, help us get this bill put through. Um, again, I don't wanna see nobody lose their property for property tax sale. Um, if have anybody comments or any, uh, you know, help would be much appreciated. We wanna make, like I said, we wanna do where we can ensure property owners keep their houses. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Long. Uh, any questions for Delegate Long? Delegate Barnes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate uh, Long, I, I think the, the same question, uh, how many homes do you think this would uh, impact? Um, if you look at the fiscal note, it, it talks about different um, jurisdictions, uh, how many, Total statewide, I'm not sure. I could, I'd be more glad to get you that. Yeah, information. Um, you know, I, I would, I would be more glad to make sure we give you accurate numbers. I, I that would be very helpful. So let's just say in your district, how mm -hmm. many homes would that impact? Hold on for me. Do we have any? Um, we don't have that number right now, but um, I know from phone calls that I'm getting that it's a lot. Um. I can't give you a, a hard number, but I'll be more more glad to uh, give you that number. It's kind of hard too because this don't this don't start until next year. Um, I, I can give you the numbers of how many people right now are um, behind on the property taxes. We can get that number for you. 
Um, and that'll give you a in, good indication. Um, we can do that for you. We'll make sure we get you that correct information. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Barnes. Thank you, Delegate Long. Any other questions uh, for Delegate Long? Uh, Delegate Hornberger, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Delegate Long, I had a question. So you're not asking for a forgiveness or a grant. You're just, this. these taxes that are owed would just be deferred farther out so folks could stay in their homes and get back on their feet to pay the Correct. tax later? Correct. Okay. Okay, and, to, and um, also, if, if you do become delinquent on your property taxes, uh, your property immediately goes to auction, right? And you can lose your home for not paying those taxes. Is that, is that also correct? Yes, sir. And okay. also I have a bill in that would um, put a, uh, uh, forgive any late fees or any uh, for, for not paying uh, late, you know, your taxes on, on time. Because what happens is you, you, your bill keeps running and they give you late fees on top of um, late fees, and you know we want to we want to you know help people out. We're we're in, we're in a bad time right now, and uh, okay. basically. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate. All right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, thank you. We're done with the hearing on House Bill 252, Delegate Long, House Bill 348. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm um, sure. Hopefully you remember this from last year, then the pandemic hit and it kind of went to the wayside. Um, for the record, Delegate Bob Long on House Bill 348, Baltimore County Homestead Tax Credit Notice and Lead and uh, Code Compliance Pilot Program. Um, what we, we want to do this pilot program in my district because I'm getting a lot of contact from people that are not receiving their homestead property tax credit. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody's eligible gets that. And on the same hand, we want to make sure that uh, someone that's not an owner occupant doesn't get it. And I've run into a few cases where somebody was claiming it was their primary residence. It was actually a rental property. And that's not fair. I mean, that's just not fair. Um, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a landlord. I do have a couple of houses and I, I pay my fair share. Um, and uh, the lead registration, this is something else we need to talk about. If uh, I believe uh, there's some people out here, it's actually claiming it's an owner occupant house so they can, um, you know, not have to deal with the lead paint laws and rental registration, things of that nature. But this program would actually uh, send out notifications and unless hopefully we can target, and I hope we don't get none back, but uh, in case we do, I, you know, someone's not getting their homestead property tax credit, we want to make sure we, that they're eligible for that. And receiving it. Thank you, Delegate Long. Uh, any questions for Delegate Long? Looking at you, Delegate Barnes. I do have one. <laughs> All right, good. I, uh, Delegate Long, I'm, I'm just curious because I think this is, is something of concern uh, as to why do you think uh, folks are not getting uh, notice or information about the homestead property tax credit? Um, we actually, we just got a, a tax assessment uh, our three-year cycle come up and it, uh, I noticed that, um, well, some people had noticed that they weren't getting it. Um, do we have a number for that? Yeah, um, hold on for a minute. We have a number of how many people in our district. Let's see. There's over 37% of people in our district that are eligible, they're not receiving it. And that's, that's what this notification is to find out why. And this will uh, separate, you know, if you're, if you're claiming a homestead property tax credit, or if you're not, um, this would show if you're a rental property, just give you a notification, you have to rent, rent um, you would have to register as a rental property. Or if you're eligible for the homestead property tax credit, you would get it. And um, like I said, we have a lot of people that have said they haven't received it. So we want to make sure everybody knows about it. So do you think it's something that we can work with SDAT uh, to figure out um, how do we get the notice out to people better? Um, or how do we market it so folks know that there, this uh, opportunity is out there? Absolutely. I'm, I'm be willing to work with you. I mean, that's something we need to do is make sure everybody's eligible for it, receives it. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Delegate Burns. Thank you, Delegate Long. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 348. We're switching now to the election law segment of our hearing, uh, starting with House Bill 136 uh, with Delegate Cardin. Uh, before he begins uh, to let people know, we do have people here from the Board of Elections who have not signed up on bills. Um, again, there's 11 election law bills, but they're here to answer uh, questions. So just letting everyone know of that. And Delegate Cardin, please go ahead, House Bill 136. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to see you and your committee. And uh, it's great to see uh, uh, Mr. Demarius from the State Board as well. And uh, Stan, it's always good to see you. So um, it's good to be back. Um, this bill is, uh, what, 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 uh, the, uh, the idea behind this bill came from um, those of you who remember back from, I believe it was 2012, when we passed the legislation to allow the second, maybe in before that, it may have been 2011, this, the, uh, the sixth location for gaming, um, which I believe was the MGM facility, uh, there was a compromise. It was the Louis Simmons compromise, but it really is a legacy of former Speaker Bush and former President Miller um, came together to compromise and decided the way to do this and to bring everybody together is to ban um, the ability to make campaign finance contributions and political contributions by um, license holders. And license holders are defined as um, anyone who owns a gaming license or at a minimum of 5% of a gaming license. Um, and so that passed for all the li video lottery terminal facilities. And we are assuming that we pass sports book um, legislation, which is under the purview of, your, I believe your committee, um, I think that those license holders should be treated the exact same way. So that's why we put in this legislation. This legislation actually does two things. It, number one, treats license holders of, of um, the, um, the, let me just turn, my hearing is on in my committee, it's disturbing. Um, it, it not only treats license holders the exact same way um, as the video live terminal license holders for sports book, but it also, treats executives of those um, different license holders the same way. So for example, if I am the CEO of, let's just say um, MGM and or um, a Horseshoe Casino in Baltimore, I'm the CEO, um, but I am personally giving money and somehow the law is not necessarily clear enough to know whether because I am not considered a license holder, I'm just an employee. I have no, um, no actual um, uh, equity stake in the license. Um, therefore, am I or am I not uh, allowed to give? And this just clarifies it and says, no, if you're an executive of one of these licenses, you are treated the same way. That's what the bill does. Thank you, Delegate Cardin. Delegate Wilkins with a question. Yes, thank you so much, Delegate Cardin, for bringing this bill. This is absolutely something that we need to explore given the current ban on contributions. I just wanted to, you started touching on this a, a little bit, and I just wanted to explore more because this was before my time in the General Assembly. In terms of how this specific ban came about, I think this is pretty much the only ban in existence, and you can correct me on that. Um, do, you, do you think that there should be so if you can explore more why sure. this particular ban, if you have that information. Um, sure. And also if there are others that that should be considered, you know, the defense attorneys that come to judiciary, the pharmaceutical companies. Oh. So I'm just great. curious about, about this to get some more background information. Great, great question. In fact, I think I asked that same question when I sat in your seat uh, years ago. Um, in my opinion, from a policy perspective, we should treat all, um, all contributors the same. We made a decision, a policy, a policy decision back in 2012 to treat license holders of gaming facilities differently. Um, and because of that compromise, which I bought into um, as a way of making sure that the legislation passed in the, in the way that I believe it should have um, in terms of treating all the other issues properly, we decided from a policy perspective. Louis Simmons was far more um, eloquent in explaining this than I could ever be. But basically, 
there is a clear connection between um, corruption and improper use of political contributions for nefarious purposes and the gaming industry, the gaming world. And that has been shown over and over and over again, um, year after year after year in multiple jurisdictions. There are bans all across the country. Not every state has them, but there are many states that do have these similar type bans. Should other industries, and the, and the argument has been made, and I think effectively, are there other industries that also should be banned um, for the same reasons? That's, that's possible, and that's really a question for a different day. <clears throat> that's not what we're dealing with here. Um, so from a policy perspective, I agree with you that we should, probably should treat all parties the same, but we decide to pull these guys out. And because of that, this particular group of license holders, because they are so closely related and there's such close related issues here, they should be treated the exact same way as uh, Vittery Lottery Terminal license holders. So that's really what I'm going at. But I agree with you, Delegate Wilkins, that the Defense Bar Association or the Trial Lawyers Association or the doctors or the, or the, um, the, uh, the people who, for example, in, in ENT, um, there's an issue with, um, we have an issue that I've been supporting for years on um, banning different chemicals from being used as pesticides. And should those people be banned from giving because there's really no positive use for any of that stuff. These are all, these are all questions that should be brought up and can be brought up. And, but that's, I think, a, a bill for a different day. All right, thank you, Delegate Cardin. Uh, other questions, Delegate Hornberger, please use the raise hand feature on the, uh, on the Zoom as well as you, Delegate Buckle. Yes, Delegate Hornberger. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Delegate Cardin. Uh, it seems like you put a lot of thought into this. And I certainly agree with you with the moral aspects of the bill and whether or not those folks should have undue influence, especially if the state is issuing them a license, which they're going to go on and make considerable amounts of profit off of. However, my concern is that uh, if I am a casino owner or someone along those lines that somehow uh, a group of people say that I get to have my first amendment rights waived. Um, you know, put straightforward, the Supreme Court's ruled on a couple instances I guess the, the biggest one, uh, Citizens United, which actually impacted state law here in Maryland about aggregate contributions, that uh, you were in fact allowed to give to whomever you want and uh, you are subject to caps on that, but you are able to give. So my, my question to you is, have you gotten an AG opinion or have you looked into the constitutional aspects of restricting an additional class of folks from making contributions? Because there have been some chatter about whether or not us restricting casino owners from giving donations is even constitutional. It has not been challenged in the courts. So that, that's what you want to expand that pool, which is understandable, but I just wonder about the um, interpretations of the AG, sure. if you could answer that. Um, Thank you. I, 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 so first of all, obviously the precedent's there to be able to do it has not been challenged. Um, mm -hmm. And Back in 2012, there was um, an attorney general opinion, which I do not have, but certainly we can provide that or we can look in the files. Um, maybe Madam Chair, I can ask um, uh, Stan to help with that. But there was a, that it, this is in fact constitutional. It does not apply by the way to federal offices, it only applies to state offices and local. Um, so um, that in, it set, in itself, the precedent set and the fact that we've been doing this now for Fit close to uh, close to ten years, um, it says that we're probably not not going to have a problem. And when you call it expanding it, I don't even think we're necessarily expanding this. I think we're just adding a group of license holders that are, for all intents and purposes, the same group. So there will be more people that will be banned, but it's not necessarily an expansion of the group, which is more to Delegate Wilkins' question as to whether we should expand it to other groups. The last thing I'll say, is, oh, I already said it, that um, this is really only a ban on state um, and Citizens United, while um, it does uh, apply everywhere, it was focused on, um, on congressional, so. Thank you. Thank you, other questions, Delegate Buckle?
Okay. A lot. Thank you, Billy McCartan. I, I just had one or two questions or comments. I have a concern in suggesting that we can constitutionally do this. Uh, and we say, well, it hasn't been challenged. Well, no one has an incentive to challenge. The existing six casino operators, they got a great situation. They don't have to donate to anyone that ever asked them to go to a single fundraiser. They can say, I'm sorry, you guys barred me. I don't think they're going to go out and spend their hard-earned money to have uh, attorneys to litigate the constitutionality of the free speech of that. And secondly, none of us are going to challenge it because, you know, we've got to respond to voters every, every four years and not say we're out there trying to challenge our own laws. So I, I have a concern that you can single out one group largely of publicly traded corporations. So you made a comment about a history of uh, uh, gambling entities being involved in nefarious activities, essentially bribing legislators to do things that they want to do. And I've heard of that history too, but you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that all of the existing casino operators and all of the known parties who are potentially applying for sports and gaming licenses, the FanDuel's, the DraftKings, the, the, those entities, they're all publicly traded corporations now, right? Subject to the SEC and disclosure and all that kind of stuff. Well, not all the not all the video live terminals, I do not believe, are publicly traded, but um, but all of the uh, yes, all these major sports book online groups, as far as I know, sports books, and, and to the best of my knowledge, from serving on the gaming committee for the last six years, all of our six casinos uh, in the state of Maryland are all publicly traded corporations that have a tremendous amount of oversight of what they do or don't do. Are you aware of any other publicly traded corporations? You know, like maybe Purdue Pharma or Johnson and Johnson that made opioids. Are you aware of any other publicly traded corporations, regardless of what they do for a living, that are banned from contributing to political candidates in Maryland? Uh, I uh, no. Thank you. Uh, All right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, any other questions uh, for Delegate Cardin? I'm looking at the hand raise and the hands raising. All right. Thank you, Delegate Cardin. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 136. We're moving on to Delegate Stein, House Bill 202. We have three people testifying. And after that, we have uh, Delegate Hill. Uh, Delegate Stein, uh, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. We've all probably heard the term faithless electors or faithless presidential electors. And, that term refers to electors who don't vote for the candidate who's gotten the most votes in their state. Fortunately, in the 2020 election, there weren't any, though there have been faithless electors in prior elections. Now, 32 states have laws that prohibit faithless voting by presidential electors, and Maryland is one of them. The state's election law says that electors are to vote for the candidate for president and vice president who received a plurality of the votes cast in the state of Maryland. But unlike 15 other states, Maryland does not have a mechanism for ensuring that electors are not faithless electors. In Maryland, if an elector votes for a candidate who didn't win the vote, there is no consequence. So this bill, House Bill 202, establishes a consequence and is modeled after the Uniform Faithful Presidential Electors Act recommended by the National Conference of Commissioners on uniform state laws. So what this bill does is several things. It establishes an alternate for each elector and electors and alternates have to sign a pledge of faithfulness. If an elector then doesn't vote for the presidential or vice presidential candidate of the party that nominated the elector, then the elector is deemed to have vacated the office and their vote doesn't count. The alternate is then appointed elector and votes in their place. So through this, this legislation, we can ensure that there are no faithless electors in Maryland in future presidential elections. Uh, common cause, national popular vote, fair vote action, or groups that endorse this bill, as has former Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele. So with that, Madam Chair, I urge a favorable vote and would be happy to take questions now or after the other witnesses have presented. Uh, we'll, we'll start with you, uh, Delegate Stein, and then we do have three witnesses. Any questions for Delegate Stein? Everyone understands the, this bill. All right. Thank you, Delegate. I'll invite the three uh, who have signed up, starting with Mr. Jay Rat Radoff. Radoff. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. It's Radoff. I'm sorry my, uh, my video doesn't seem to be working. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee. My name is Jay Radoff. I'm a lawyer, and for the past 27 years, I was the president of Gebco Insurance, a property and casualty insurance agency, and its affiliated insurance entities. I have testified before the Senate Finance Committee and the House Economic Matters Committee dozens of times, but this is my first time before this committee. Today, I'm testifying before you not as a member of any organization, but simply as a concerned citizen. In addition to Delegate Stein's testimony, I would like to emphasize one point. Under Maryland's current law, the consequences of one or more faithless electors in Maryland could be problematic. For example, suppose that after all 50 states and Washington DC have certified their presidential election results, the number of electoral votes throughout the United States is 270 for candidate A and 268 for candidate B. Further assume that Maryland's populace has made a decisive choice for candidate A, who has won states representing 270 electoral votes. Nevertheless, in that hypothetical case, even one faithless candidate A, Maryland elector, would reduce the number of candidate A's electoral votes to 269, thus throwing the presidential election into the US House of Representatives. And two faithless candidate A, Maryland electors, who switched from candidate A to candidate B could change the result of the election from candidate A to candidate B. Should it be so easy for one or more faithless electors to potentially undo the will of approximately 150 million American voters? You might say that such an outcome is highly unlikely. However, I would like to make three quick points. First, in 2000, George W. Bush received 271 electoral votes. Thus, two faithless George W. Bush electors would have thrown the election into the House of Representatives. Two, in 2016, there were 10 faithless electors in the United States. Three of those 10 faithless votes were invalidated pursuant to state laws similar to that of House Bill 202 and were replaced by electoral votes for the candidate who won the popular vote in those states. However, the other seven votes from faithless electors were cast for and counted for non-candidates. Third, speaking as a certified insurance counselor and licensed insurance advisor, think of it as insurance. You want to be protected just in case a highly unlikely or unthinkable event does actually occur. For Thank that you, reason Mr. and the reason stated by the sponsor, I urge a favorable report on House Bill 202. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next person testifying is Mr. Saul Anuzis. Anuzis, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. I did see you on the uh, on the Zoom, sir. Are you there? Okay, there we go. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman and members. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of the faithless presidential election bill, House Bill 202, as introduced by Delegate Stein. Uh, he actually did a very good job of describing what the bill does, so I don't want to, I'm not going to repeat what he said. Uh, I'm the senior advisor for National Popular Vote, I'm also former chairman of the Michigan Republican Party and member of the Republican National Party. Um, I was authorized to basically put a statement in favor of uh, national popular vote organization, as well as common cause and fair vote. Um, we submitted our uh, testimony in writing uh, online as required, but common cause and fair vote, unfortunately didn't do it on time, but I did get a copy to Representative Stein. Um, I will just say that this is a very straightforward bill. Um, I hate to call it a technical bill, but it ensures that voters will vote the way or um, electors will vote the way they've agreed to vote uh, following their state laws. And uh, we would encourage passage of this bill. Uh, I think it will take away any uncertainties or additional uncertainties that sometimes arise in the presidential election process. So with that, I don't want to take any more of your time. I just thank you for the opportunity and encourage you to support this bill to help uh, make the process a little more obvious and cleaner um, for everybody moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, is, is, uh, I don't see uh, Mr. Keller here. 
So if uh, members have questions for the uh, two gentlemen who testified, uh, please raise your hand. All right, I'm not seeing any raised hands on the participant list or live. Uh, that being the case, thank you all very much. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 202. We'll move to a Delegate Hill's bill, House Bill 245. Thank you, Delegate Stein. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Vice Chair and Committee members. I am presenting House Bill 245, which does three things. It requires that training for election judges include both oral instruction and written material on a range of methods that may be used to assist or accommodate elderly or disabled voters in voting. It ensures that judges are, that are assigned to a specific voting location are made aware of which accommodations are available at that location. And it also requires that the specific accommodations that are available at each voting site are posted on a sign and that the sign is outside of the voting location as well as with the amendment outside of the room where the votes are held. And the idea is really simple. If someone needs accommodations, they should know when they arrive at the site what is available and not have to ask or wonder. It's, and that's simply all the bill does. Thank you, Delegate. We've got the support of the ACLU and the support of the Maryland Association of Elections. Thank you. All right, thank you. A very, very brief, concise explanation. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Delegate Wilkins. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. And, and thank you, Delegate, for introducing this bill that really ensures the rights of our elderly and people with disabilities. Um, I, I was just wondering if it would be possible for um, the, the Board of Elections to comment if there was any, um, if they have a position. Um, I'm just trying to see if they had any, any comments in terms of implementation of this legislation. Right. I spoke with, uh, with uh, Mr. Damaris about the bill. Um, we don't have anything in writing, but he thought it was a good bill. He thought that it hit the spot of actually improving um, access and transparency, gives Delegate something Hill, for the- We, we have, De uh, we have Jared Demarin is here. So I, I think uh, Delegate will oh. hear from him directly. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Demarin is. Uh, hi, uh, Jared Demarinus, uh, Director of Candidacy and Campaign Finance for the Maryland State Board of Elections. Uh, this bill uh, offers a lot of flexibility for the local boards and doesn't put any sort of undue uh, burdens on uh, election judges. It just offers training and then signage. So individuals with disabilities or elderly who wish to avail themselves of this uh, can go in front uh, and go to the front of the line and talk to the election judges and they're aware of the situation to get prioritized voting uh, as well as if uh, if there is a long line there and they and other voters see uh, individuals moving up they can they know about the policy ahead of time as well so that they're not going to get upset about uh, an individual say cutting in line if they've been waiting for a half hour or so uh, so that helps uh, alleviate that uh, the state board doesn't take any official position. It's just offer informational purposes here, but uh, it does uh, have some benefits and allows customization uh, for uh, individual polling place needs and uh, locations as well without mandating any sort of uh, burdens on election judges. Thank you, Mr. Demarinus. Uh, Delegate you. Wilkins, further questions on that? No additional questions. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Sure, thank you. I thought that was a great answer. Um, any uh, other questions for uh, for Delegate Hill or, or Mr. Demarinus? Uh, thank you. Uh, we do have one person testifying. We have Tammy Bresnahan. And again, just please take it with the amendment. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means Committee. I'm Tammy Bresnahan. I'm the Director of Advocacy for AARP Maryland. And you've heard all the specifics of the bill. We're thrilled that um, Delegate Hills put this bill in. We supported a similar bill and you'll hear that with Delegate Guyton at House Bill 247. Um, I just wanna say, give a shout out to the Board of Elections. We worked with them during this past election and we did 
three, if not four, teletown halls that would help our membership understand how to vote, where to vote, when to vote. And they were on all of those calls at least an hour answering questions from about 10,000 people across the state. So we are thrilled that they are supporting House Bill 245, which requires the election judges to receive training. They have gone out of their way to help our population and we are very supportive of House Bill 245. Thank you for letting me testify today and I can take any questions if needed. Thank you, Ms. Bresnahan. Um, any questions for Ms. Bresnahan? Uh, seeing none, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 245. Uh, we're moving on to Delegate Moon's bill, House Bill 265. Delegate Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, friends, on uh, Ways and Means. So this is a familiar one for you. Um, I will try and not rehash too much here. Um, this is my seventh year um, trying to get some reform done on how we fill vacancies when our own offices um, are vacant. So this is what we do for delegate and state Senate vacancies. This bill before you um, is one attempt at a compromise. Uh, this bill passed unanimously uh, out of the state Senate last year. Um, and it was a bipartisan bill from Senators Lamb and Huff. So what it does is it says basically if there's a vacancy in the first year of a four year term, um, the Central Committee is still gonna make a temporary appointment, but at the presidential election, we will add one race to the ballot we're already paying for, um, and that will be a special election to fill the, the last two years of a delegate term. Um, and I'm happy to work with you, as you know, on you know tweaks to this or different timing aspects to try and get something uh, moving on this, but the Senate again is ready to go. It's been seven years and many of our colleagues have tried from both parties for years before me. So um, the time is now. And the only new thing I would throw at you is, um, I think the COVID mail balloting um, pilot basically that we did this year gives an alternative opportunity to be able to do a snap special election without the low turnout concerns and I would just throw that um, out there because I know there is strong sentiment in favor of uh, more democracy and giving voters a choice over um, who uh, serves in office for them. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Delegate Moon. Are there any questions for, for Delegate Moon? Uh, Delegate Barnes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Moon. I know you've been bringing this bill uh, before. Um, and I just have some concerns. You know, as the chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus of Maryland, I've seen more and more Black members uh, serving as a result of the current appointment process. Uh, and especially I've seen more and more women get appointed. Uh, so I'm just thinking um, this appointment process promotes diversity. Uh, so with your bill, how is this going to affect the diversity within the chamber? It's a good question. If we went to a snap special election, I think there might be a little bit more of that concern. Um, but to be clear, this bill in no way replaces or eliminates the role of the central committees. Um, the compromise we worked out after a number of years is to allow the central committees to make the temporary appointment just as they do now. Um, it's really just about when um, that appointed members uh, reelection would occur. And again, you will see that when we have a new governor, um, of either party, as soon as they take office, they're likely to pull delegates and senators into their cabinet. And you are gonna have a number of districts across the state where there's basically a vacant four-year term. Um, and it's not gonna be right to let an appointee sit for four years in office um, unelected when we're paying for elections in that time. So we gotta find a compromise here. And I'm, again, I'm happy to work with you on it um, to figure it out. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, let, let's let's talk and see what we can do. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, uh, Delegate Moon, you have a question. Delegate Wilkins. 
Thank you, Delegate Moon, um, for your persistence in this legislation. I know we have um, a couple new members in the committee and you have presented this bill several times, but if you can just walk us through um, how this would work in practice in terms of a member that is appointed. And I'm particularly interested in um, the potential of someone getting appointed even potentially right before a session and having to immediately run um, and keeping in mind the, the, the people of color and women that have been appointed most recently to um, the, the state house, how that would work. So if you can just kind of walk us through um, how this would work. And also my second question is that there've been a, a lot of feedback around the appointment process in terms of like publicizing um, the, the process, public engagement, um, and, and just other criticisms of the appointment process, does this bill address um, any of those issues as well? So on your latter point, you know, I know in, in the past, there's been question about like, well, shouldn't we rein in the central committees themselves? And I know like in Montgomery, they have hearings and, and, a, and a clear bylaw process for how these are filled. Um, it's an interesting question. I think it, it could be tackled. There are likely some free association issues with respect to, um, the state telling parties how to conduct some of their functions. Um, so it's not to say there's a bar there. Again, happy to work with you on this if that's um, something you feel strongly about. One, one thing I would say is let's just get a ball in the air um, so that we can begin um, talking about these kinds of things with the Senate. You know, they put a very clean um, bill forward and I, I, will, I will be the first to admit the Senate and the House are in different circumstances. So in past years, when I argued for this bill, one of the things I pointed out is this is basically the system we've begun to adopt for every other office. And so we're in that uncomfortable position where we, the lawmakers, are telling every other elected official in the state, here's how we think your office should be filled if it comes to a vacancy. And it's a two-step. All of these other ones, attorney general, comptroller, um, they're done the same way. The, part, the departing party, um, of the official, the official depart the party of the departed official um, would choose a temporary replacement, and if there's a regularly scheduled election after that, they would go on the ballot. The only race that's not true for would be U.S. House, and that's because the terms are only two years. Um, but for all of these other four and six year term offices, we try and give voters a say um, at the first regularly scheduled election we have an opportunity for. Now, the one weird thing that I think this is the source of the problem is we have a fundraising ban um, for House members when the legislature is in session. So many appointees, um, even those appointed because the governor chose them into a cabinet, you're right, um, they're going to get in there um, and they're not going to be able to fundraise for several months and then potentially be called into an immediate election. Um, but again, I think there's a few ways to deal with that, um, either to... Uh, shorten the length of time before um, the election is called um, or to do something else like um, create an exception um, to certain things. So we, but again, I, I think these are solvable issues um, and we just got to uh, uh, figure out where we can get um, into the middle with the Senate. Thank you, Delegate Moon. Thank you, um, uh, Delegate Wilkins. Uh, we do the were there any I didn't see any other questions so we'll take the next three people who are the three people signed up to testify starting with Joanne Antoine from Common Cause. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Uh, good you. afternoon. Oh, sorry. Uh, good afternoon Chair Kaiser, uh, Vice Chair Washington and members of the committee. Uh, for the record my name is Joanne Antoine, uh, Executive Director of Common Cause Maryland, uh, testifying in support of House Bill 265 which would, um, you know, if approved by voters uh, would require uh, special elections in the instances where there are legislative vac vacancies um, before the specified time period. You know, as an organization obviously our priority is ensuring that the voices uh, of Marylanders are heard in the process, um, especially when it's in regards to who is rep uh, representing them uh, in Annapolis, right? I think if you all were to talk to your constituents uh, as we talk to our members, uh, they overwhelmingly agree that they want to have a say in who is representing them. Um, and I'm sure if we were to poll the state, you know, it, it would probably um, 
be, you know, really, really high, right? Um, we instead, you know, have to look at the process as it is. It is flawed. We have a process where a small pool of individuals, you know, most of whom, you know, we consider political insiders who are left making decisions on behalf of thousands of voters who live in the district. Um, you know, and while this bill doesn't address that completely, it is a starting point, right? Allowing for voters to have some say, you know, if the legislative vacancy happens before, you know, this specified period of time. Um, I know that there were a number of concerns raised uh, last session, uh, most of which uh, Delegate Moon has tried to address. Um, I know a big one, you know, that has come up already was around diversity. And while we agree as, as a black woman, right, I want to see more people who look like me in these positions. Um, we as an organization are working towards building a more reflective democracy. Um, but, you know, what I found is in my conversations with central committee leaders, right, a lot of times there is no actual, how would I say, regard um, for diversity, right? We're not looking at the county delegation as a whole and looking for uh, gaps, you know, in the number of women, uh, the number of people of color in these positions. So there really is no guarantee that in this flawed process uh, that um, the central committees, right, are going to make diversifying uh, the central committee, uh, the general assembly a priority. Um, we instead should be looking at ways that we can eliminate barriers to running for office. We know that fundraising is always a huge part of that. And that's where public financing and other methods come, um, come into this process. So, you know, I would say again, as a committee that is tasked with looking at ways to expand access to the ballot and ensuring that Marylanders have an actual voice in our democracy, this shouldn't be, you know, this really should be a no brainer, right? Uh, this, this bill doesn't eliminate uh, the, the central committee process. Uh, they still play a role. Um, and obviously that is something we want to work to eliminate completely down the line, but I hope that you all will do what's right here and ensure that the people you represent actually have a say in, in the people that are coming to make decisions that impact their everyday lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Antoine. The uh, next person signed up to testify is uh, Christy Demnowitz. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Delegate. Kaiser, Delegate Washington, and members of the committee. Um, I actually, I'm actually opposed to this bill, and so is Represent Maryland, the organization that I rep I'm representing today, and we're a nonpartisan member group that uh, has members all across the state working on pro-democracy um, issues, just like Joanne from Common Cause. And I actually want to second everything that she said, except that um, this bill is an unnecessary step in the process. We 100% want for the state of Maryland to use real special elections. Oops, that's my dog, sorry. In order to fill their vacancies. Um, and this bill is a misleading and unnecessary step in that process um, because it will go to a ballot. It does say special elections. It doesn't say that um, the special elections are just moved up it, and people are gonna believe that they're real special elections that they're gonna to get to participate in to choose their next lawmaker. They're not gonna realize that the central committee is still cho choosing their next lawmaker. Um, so I think that's something that's worth considering. And as a taxpayer and a voter, um, I don't think that it's worth putting this on our next ballot because it's going to mislead people into believing we're doing something that we're not. So that's our biggest argument against it. But other than that, we agree with um, everything Joanne and others have said about the need to have more participation in, our, in filling our vacancies. Um, and that would be true special elections. And I want to address the um, concern about diversity, which is an absolutely valid concern. Um, the 2018 election resulted in the most diverse legislature in Maryland history. And that I did some math and that was from elected officials, not just appointed officials. Um, but also since 2018, we've had the most appointments in Maryland history. A third of all the appointments in the last 30 years have taken place in the last three years. And now the House is 22% appointed and the Senate is 25% appointed. And I think that's a shocking number for voters when they find out that that's how high the numbers are. Um, so as far as this bill goes, I just think that it's something that we don't need to push forward right now. We can work together to find solutions to the concerns. One of the solutions, again, is the public election fund that we work on with Common Cause and a number of other advocates in order to make running through the democratic process and being elected more accessible and equitable to all. Um, so we, our position is this is not something that needs to get pushed through this year. It doesn't need to go into the ballot. 
and we should think about a serious solution to this issue, not just a temporary, you know, misleading bill, which is what I believe this is. Uh, so thank you again. I'm happy to answer any questions. And we did submit written testimony as well with more uh, information about the history of the appointments and things like that. Uh, thank you very much. The next person testifying is Justin Gallardo. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, yes. So first of all, good afternoon, Chairwoman Kaiser and members of the committee. I am here again to speak in opposition to this bill. I'm not going to go into detail as to what the problem is. We know what the problem is, and we know that this bill will not solve any of the problems of central committee appointments as the vacancy is only from after the midterm up until the presidential filing deadline, which is one year. And to think after the presidential election and before the midterms, there are elections across the state as there are municipality elections. And I have heard claims that having a special election is just too expensive. And I believe that undermines the board of elections in this state. Just my home jurisdiction of Baltimore County, we have, are extremely well prepared. In 2017, Baltimore County purchased 35 optimal scanners. We bought an additional 17 from the state, so that's 52 optimal scanners. And under fiscal year 2018, tablets and printers were loaned at $1.6 million. It is stored in a warehouse in Hunt Valley and is protected by the Baltimore County Police Department of no charge. This lease again will be renewed this year for fiscal year 2022. It was done right before the midterms of 2018. It was done during a congressional special election to fill the seat of the late Elijah Cummings and during the 2020 presidential election during a global pandemic. I think it's safe to say that these elections went very smoothly, but it also takes away that the Board of Elections needs to just open the warehouse. They need to set up the equipment, print the ballots, and open polling sites. It's not alchemy. And I have also heard that special elections impede on school time. It does not. Please refer to your local school board calendar. It says an emergency day and it replies to unpredictable situations like weather, civil unrest, and even a congressional special election. It does not cost the school money. And ultimately the Board of Education is at their discretion to adjust the calendar if it goes into over five emergency allocated days. Please refer to the state's annotated code as to why schools are selected as polling sites. It costs nothing to the Board of Elections and there are just more frequent facilities than there are rec centers and libraries. I don't wanna hear any more excuses about cost and I ask for an unfavorable report and demand a better bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, I wanna see if there's any questions and I, I did, uh, should have had a set of questions after Ms. Antoine, who was favorable uh, before we had the two unfavorables. So um, any questions first for uh, Ms. Antoine on the favorable, anyone? Uh, seeing no hands and then any hands, uh, any raised hands on, uh, to address the two unfavorable. All right, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Delegate Moon. Thanks, thank you all uh, to those who've testified. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, House Bill 335 from uh, Delegate Boyce, followed by Delegate Rosenberg, and then we're going to make a switch for Delegate Palakovich Carr to be able to get to judiciary on time. Delegate Boyce, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Happy New Year to you guys. Um, for the record, I am uh, Delegate Regina T. Boyce, here to testify on HB 335, election law, party, and public offices, excuse me, um, prohibitions. I just want to make a point that this bill did pass your committee last year, um, 15 to seven, and it passed the House floor, uh, 101 to 29. So I did bring back this bill. Um, the bill prohibits elected officials from also holding or registering for an elected office as a party official or the state central committee. Historically, the organizing of parties began in 1824 and was codified into law in 18. 86, it is stated that, quote, when primary elections developed at the end of the 19th century, state central committees formed to oversee their conduct, unquote. The role of the state central committees, grassroots elected volunteers, is to build the party organization at each district level. This is, of course, is done in many ways, getting out the vote by registering residents to vote, organizing and encouraging voter turnout during the primary and general elections, fundraising for the party, and 
it facilitates the vacancy process to provide nominations to the governor. For decades, the practice of holding both elected offices has been questionable. The allowance of holding both position poses an interesting dynamic and conflicts of interest in the state central committee member's role, as well as the elected role. The allowance assumes automatic next in line policies and politics that distorts the democratic process and the true role of the elected party office. I, as well as a number of my constituents, thank you for assisting us with this correcting allowance and um, ask for, again, a favorable report. Thank you, Delegate Boyce. Members, any questions uh, for Delegate Boyce? All right, um, seeing none, we will uh, move on to the, the next bill. Thank you, Delegate. Thank uh, you so much. Bill we is uh, Del uh, Delegate Rosenberg, House Bill 369. Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, this legislation was before the committee last year. Uh, you gave it a favorable report and it uh, was one of those that never got a hearing in the Senate. Uh, it takes us one step further with regard to protecting our uh, election hardware and software from foreign manipulation. Uh, existing law provides that there must be disclosure of foreign ownership of an election system. Uh, this legislation requires that there be comparable disclosure of any aspect, uh, any of the hardware, any component bolts uh, of such a system. And contracts uh, with any providers must provide for disclosure uh, with regarding measures taken to ensure uh, that there is not uh, malfeasance, and uh, this bill is modeled upon H.R. 1, the For the People Act, which passed the House of Representatives uh, in the prior session of the, of the Congress of the United States, uh, a legislation introduced by Congressman Sarbanes. He there is a letter uh, accompanying my testimony, uh, his letter from last year in support, uh, and I would urge the committee to again give favorable action uh, to this legislation. Appreciate a favorable. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Rosenberg. Uh, members, any questions for the delegate? All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 369. To thank you. Members, we've done uh, 10. We have five bills to go. We are taking a bill out of order to accommodate a, our co a colleague who has to go to another committee. Uh, everyone left is from, every bill sponsor left is from our committee, by the way. Uh, Delegate Palakovich Carr, House Bill 398, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, so much for accommodating uh, the schedule change. Judiciary is actually moving along at a, at a good clip today, so I feel good for our colleagues over there. So for the record, Delegate Julie Palakovich Carr here to present House Bill 398. Um, this is reintroduction of legislation to expand paid time off for voting. Uh, right now in Maryland, uh, someone who is an hourly or shift worker who is scheduled to work for the entire duration that the polls are open on election day uh, can get up to two hours of paid time off to go vote, so long as they are already a registered voter. Uh, this bill makes a, a couple of changes um, in this regard to, to state law. First of all, it would give those workers the opportunity to go vote during early voting or on election day. We know that early voting is a popular choice for many voters who want to skip the lines on election day. And secondly, this legislation uh, continues implementation of same day voter registration. Now that that's the law here in Maryland, um, it makes sense to give paid time off for people who are eligible to vote but not yet registered so that they can in fact register and vote at the polls. Uh, this legislation did pass this committee and the House last session on a bipartisan basis. And I appreciate all of your support last year in that regard. Um, we do have written testimony in support of this legislation from a number of groups, including the Maryland Association of Election Officials, the ACLU, the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, Maryland Legislative Coalition, Represent Maryland, Every District, and Do the Most Good. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, any questions for Delegate Palakovic-Carr? All right, uh, I guess we're done with the hearing on House Bill 398. Go forth, good luck in judiciary. All right, uh, Delegate Wilkins, House Bill 222. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. All right, here we go. Good afternoon, colleagues. I am pleased to present HB 222. For the record, I am State Delegate Janelle Wilkins. 
The foundation of this bill is that our democracy and election system should ensure that every single eligible voter has the opportunity and full access to the right to vote. Our election should not leave any voter behind, but there is one population in particular that is often shut out of voting, and that's our eligible incarcerated individuals. Most people who are incarcerated in jail have the right to vote. Many of them are pretrial, they're awaiting their case or serving a misdemeanor and have the right to vote, but have limited access to the ability to vote. HB 222 does a few things. It ensures that upon release, incarcerated individuals are provided a voter registration application and also informed of their right to vote. It also ensures that those under the supervision of parole and probation also receive this information and have um, posted notice. And very importantly, for those who are incarcerated and who are eligible, it requires SBE to adopt regulations establishing a program to inform eligible voters of the upcoming elections and support their access to the ballot. The House did pass a version of this bill last year, and I want to thank colleagues for their support. Um, it wasn't able to pass in the Senate prior to our abrupt adjournment last year. However, between this bill passing the House last year and the hearing today, we've had a, an historic election where once again, eligible incarcerated voters struggle to vote due to the current process um, and also because of the pandemic. We have a lot of very important lessons learned from the 2020 election that have informed the current bill and the associated amendments. During the election, without this bill in place, several of the individuals testifying that you're going to hear from actually worked to create a system and program to ensure the voting rights of incarcerated individuals. They visited correctional facilities, they held information sessions about the right to vote, they risked themselves during the pandemic to coordinate a, a voting access tour where they went to detention facilities um, to remind jail administrators of their duties and the rights um, of those inside. So, what we learned is that there is a great need for this legislation. And more importantly, it's not enough to have a general voting policy in place. It's not enough to leave the correctional facilities to their own devices and just hope that they provide equal access to the ballot for incarcerated individuals who have just as much of a right to vote as you and I. Um, from our lessons in 2020, the program really has to have strong leadership and collaboration with the State Board of Elections, with the correctional facilities, and with community organizations. We also have to ensure oversight and accountability. And finally, having a comprehensive program that ensures equal access to the ballot. Um, as you all have seen, this has been a major issue all across the country. We're seeing more and more programs put in place. Even in the Cook County Jail in Chicago, it actually served as a primary election precinct for the first time due to their legislation. This is a, a national issue that we have the opportunity um, to make sure we pass in a robust um, way this year. So I wanna thank the committee again for your passage of um, a version of this bill last year. I wanna um, urge the, the, the lessons learned from the 2020 election that you're going to hear about from other panelists and um, ask for your favorable report on this bill that is a reflection of what we've seen um, happen in practice. So thank you so much for your attention and time. Uh, if, if members have uh, questions for Delegate Wilkins and I uh, forgot to mention that uh, the Judici Judiciary Committee is second on this bill. So Delegates Erickson. Crutchfield and Shetty are on here as well, and they are certainly free to ask, of course, to ask questions as well. Are there any questions for Delegate Wilkins? All right, thank you. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll start with the uh, people who've signed up, uh, starting with uh, Nicole Hansen Mundell. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us today and thank you for hearing this, this very important piece of legislation. For the record, my name is Nicole Hansen Mundell. I am the executive director of Out for Justice, a nonprofit based um, organization whose mission is to educate, engage, and empower formerly and currently incarcerated um, citizens around the legislative process and really showing them how to use this process to help to advance their successful reentry. Um, we, of course, are here in support of House Bill 0222, um, 
primarily because this is an issue that not only affects my member base, but it, it affects me. It, it happened to me. Uh, I once was incarcerated um, a time ago and really desired the, the opportunity to cast my ballot um, because I knew that I was coming home one day and I knew that uh, what, what happens in my community um, impacts me and my children. Um, the one thing I want to mention to you all is that you might not hear from our national partners, the Sentencing Project and the Campaign Legal Center, but their testimony is on the record and they work with us um, uh, all throughout the last election to ensure that individuals um, pre-trial had access to the ballot. Um, Out for Justice was a part of uh, the State Board of Elections uh, subcommittee. They had a, a specific committee that would help to engage and inform them of what was happening on the ground. And at that time, we really had to apply some pressure and really advocate for ourselves that the law that currently exists had to be implemented. And, you know, I want to, you know, really say that this legislation is important because, you know, we can pass laws all day. But if we are not ensuring that these laws are implemented, then it's almost like we're wasting our time. And we never want to waste the time of the, of the Maryland General Assembly. Um, over this past election, we were able to do something very historical. We were able to push the state board to do something they had never done before, which is to engage the, the pre-trial population and to invest funding into formerly and currently incarcerated people. And they did that. And even in their 2020 report, they acknowledged the work that they did. They acknowledged that they had never done it before. And they are in support of this legislation. We saw, um, you will find that there were some tweaks in the bill only because this specific group of people that you're gonna hear from was able to actually implement the law, talk with wardens. Uh, we went into the jails in Howard County and Carroll County and registered uh, men and women to vote. We submitted certain PIA requests um, to uh, the, the Department of Corrections. We were able to um, put out flyers in the institutions, created hotlines and so, we actually was able to implement the very policy that we hope you all are able to pass this, this, this session because it is increasingly important. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do have nine people signed up, so I'll um, ask for questions after each uh, three people. Things moving a little bit. Um, the next person signed up to speak is um, Latasha Fasson, Fason. I apologize. Latasha was one of my members, I'm sorry, uh, committee chair, she was one of my members and had some, some technical difficulties getting on. And her testimony would just be that she got out of prison, was eligible to vote, and she got uh, this particular letter in the mail from the State Board of Elections telling her that she could not vote when in fact we knew the law allowed her to vote. And so she had to go through uh, contacting the State Board they in turn told her to write a letter stating that, uh, you know, she was eligible. So, you know, there were some things that she had to go through. And we can only imagine thousands of people who this letter was generated um, during the last primary and general election, which is also a reason why this piece of legislation is so important, because we do not want to isolate uh, eligible voters from having access to the ballot. Okay. So that would have been her testimony. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next time we just, just say that she's not here. We you can't uh, testify uh, twice. Um, we do have a lot of people on this bill. Uh, Kaylin Young, is Kaylin here? I believe he submitted a uh, written testimony instead of oral. So I apologize for that, uh, that, that okay. discretion. We can move on to the next speaker, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Antoine. Uh, yes, Joanne Antoine again, uh, for the record, uh, testifying in support of uh, House Bill 222. I know that we're limited on time. Uh, Delegate Wilkins and uh, Nicole have already covered, you know, a lot of the reasons why uh, we need to ensure that uh, in eligible uh, incarcerated Marylanders have meaningful access uh, to the ballot in these facilities and that they're made aware of their rights to vote um, upon release. Um, I think, you know, as mentioned by Nicole, um, during the general election, right, our coalition was able to partner with the state board uh, to try and very quickly um, put together a process that would allow for, um, 
you know, those individuals to be able to vote in the election. You know, I think all parties would agree that um, while it was great that we did it, you know, that we need to uh, eliminate the hurdles that we had to go through in order for the state board to get actual access to lists of eligible voters. Uh, we need to address the time in which it takes for ballots um, or other election related materials to make it through a mail both to and from the facility. Um, and we, we need to work to ensure that um, the, these eligible incarcerated individuals have access to election officials and that there's some oversight over this process. Um, you know, I won't go through all of the um, amendments, but uh, you know, we we believe that they're necessary, right? Uh, the state board can't effectively, you know, move forward with a program like this unless they receive these lists in a timely manner. Um, drop boxes would help eliminate a lot of the issues that we're experiencing with mail um, and correction staff working with us to help sort that mail, you know, and ensure that the voter gets it within two days time period and, and two days out helps ensure that um, voters, um, ballots, you know, and their registration forms are meeting these deadlines. And, you know, things like the free call list, voters inside have no way of communicating with election officials if there's any issues, if they have questions about how they're filling out their forms, if they're facing any intimidation and so forth, right? And we want to ensure that there's a phone number on the free call list so that they can talk to someone. Um, I, I know that I have like no more time left. Uh, our partners at ACLU did manage to, you know, submit a PIA request, you know, when we got information from uh, corrections around the policy that they have in place, what we found was that a lot of the information that they were providing to voters was incorrect. Deadlines were wrong. The posters had incorrect information. So, you know, having this ombuds position or some role that is dedicated within the state board to oversee this ensures that the process or the information being provided in these facilities that they're actually accurate. So I hope that you all will, you know, again, move forward with supporting this bill uh, with these necessary amendments. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Ms. Antoine. Uh, the next person we have signed up is Monica Cooper. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Fantastic. I'm going to try to wrap this up as quick as possible. Good afternoon, Chairman Kaiser. My name is Monica Cooper. I am a formerly incarcerated woman and I'm also an elected official. I ran for the Democratic State Central Committee in the 40th District and my peers decided that they wanted me to be a part of the leadership. If it had not been for my right to vote, and the fact that my votes were uh, restored to me, I would not be able to be uh, some folks' colleagues. And I just wanted to, to stress how important it is that individuals who are incarcerated have access to the ballot. Currently, currently throughout the country, we see this shift and this move to ensure that every single vote counts. In such a polarized country where every single vote counts, I think it's very important that we make sure that all of those things that my colleagues mentioned are implemented. I personally, Maryland Justice Project, I'm the executive director, we went to all 24 counties in the state of Maryland. It was grueling. We went through every single one and we knocked on each door of the detention center, Somerset County, Cecil County, Carroll County, to ensure that these things were in place because prior to the push that we've had this past uh, um, uh, general election, these things weren't in place. It was people, men and women, who were able to vote for some of you guys. Some of those votes from Towson uh, Detention Center, from Somerset Detention Center, and from detention centers across the uh, uh, state actually went to some of you guys that's sitting on this panel today. So I would just encourage a favorable vote for HB uh, 222 because it's the right thing to do. Maryland has been a trendsetter. Maryland has set the bar high when it comes to granting everybody access to the ballot. And I am hoping and, uh, uh, that you guys would continue that trend. Every single vote count. It's the person's right. Just because you have gotten a pickle does not mean you lose your right to vote. And the last thing I wanna say is as an elected official, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how relieved I was that my dear Merlin would allow me to not only vote as a returning citizen, but also be a representative. And the people who I represent in the 40th district, they are just super excited to see formerly incarcerated people not only vote, but also be on a ballot. 
I can't tell you how important it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions for these uh, first four or five witnesses? Uh, if not, I'll move on to the next few. Um, next, we have Dana Pekowski. Is Dana here? Dana's a national partner. We thought she wasn't yeah. able to sign up, okay. um, but yeah. Thank you. All right. The next then is uh, Monica Cooper. I'm sorry, you spoke, Ms. Cooper. Um, all right. Uh, is there also a Kadeem Cooper here? Okay. Uh, next on the list, uh, Mark. Uh, Chairwoman Kaiser, I'm Marcia Johnson Blanco with the Lawyers Committee. Kadeem oh. Cooper signed up on my behalf. Okay. Please, please go. Thank you. Um, Chairwoman Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony regarding the value of my vote at HB 222. My name is Marcia Johnson Blanco, and I co-direct the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, uh, a national nonpartisan civil rights nonprofit founded by President John Kennedy. And also, I also oversee the work of election protection the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection program. I'm also a Maryland resident. We strongly urge passage of HB 222 by this committee and the Maryland General Assembly. This legislation addresses a glaring need. Individuals in jail are often de facto disenfranchised by state and local officials because they are prevented from accessing registration or absentee ballot materials or provided misinformation about their eligibility to vote while in jail. This legislation would ensure that the state of Maryland exercises its constitutional duty. Individuals incarcerated in jails in Maryland are often eligible and are denied the right to have their voices heard in the electoral process. Those individuals may be awaiting trial or serving time for a misdemeanor. And HB 222 ensures that these citizens can make their voices heard in the democratic process. By passing the Value My Vote Act, Maryland would join a growing list of jurisdictions that are taking steps to address the de facto disenfranchisement of eligible voters in jail. These jurisdictions, including Chicago, Denver, Houston, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia, and the District of Columbia, have taken affirmative steps to ensure voters have the means they need to register and cast ballots. Additionally, several states have adopted reforms like those proposed in the Value My Vote Act. In Colorado, for example, the Secretary of State requires county clerks to submit a plan developed with county sheriffs on how eligible incarcerated persons will be able to register and vote from jail. Other states like Illinois and California have enacted provisions which require state and local officials to provide information about registering to vote to individuals upon release from incarceration. The Maryland General Assembly should pass the Value My Vote Act and join the movement to protect the voting rights of incarcerated individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person signed up is Janet Millinson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Janet Millinson and I'm representing the League of Women Voters of Maryland. The League supports the Value My Vote Act because we support an election system that's equitable, that's accessible, and that increases voter participation. We also supported the legislation that as of the 2016 election, restored voting rights to felons who have served their sentence and to non-felons who are currently incarcerated, such as people in jail awaiting trial. However, restoring the right to vote isn't the same as enabling people to exercise that right. It's like sending someone a gift card when they have no way to redeem it. That's why this bill is so important. Prisoners generally don't have a convenient way to register to vote or to apply for a mail-in ballot. It's hard for them to get detailed information about the candidates who are running or the issues that are on the ballot. The League spent a lot of time and energy working to deliver our nonpartisan voters guides to eligible voters behind bars before the recent general election. But volunteer efforts can only go so far. 
This bill requires correctional facilities to give people who are being released a voter registration application, along with written notification that their voting rights have been restored. For people who are eligible to vote, but are still incarcerated, the facility must work with the state or local board of elections to provide opportunities to register and to vote securely. Voting makes people feel they have a stake in their community. When we make it easier for eligible incarcerated and recently released Marylanders to exercise their voting rights, it shows their community has a stake in them too. Therefore, the League of Women Voters of Maryland urges you to pass House Bill 222, the Value My Vote Act. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next we'll have uh, Ms. Uh, Demo Nowitz. Sorry for messing that name up. Hey, it's Christy Demowitz. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Washington, Chair Kaiser, members of the committee. Um, there's not a lot for me to say that hasn't been said by Delegate Wilkins and Joanne and Nicole and Monica and other um, witnesses, but we just want to add our support to this bill. Again, I'm representing Represent Maryland, a nonpartisan pro-democracy group. We have members all across the state. We work on a number of different pro-democracy solutions, and one of them is ending voter suppression. So um, our position is basically that if people who are currently incarcerated legally have the right to vote, but don't have access or are given incorrect information, that is absolutely a form of voter suppression. And if the Maryland General Assembly believes that voter suppression is bad, then we need to do everything we can to fix it. And that starts by passing the Value My Vote Act. Um, we haven't engaged on this issue as nearly as much as other people who have testified have. And so I think it's a testament to how important this is to hear from somebody like Monica or Nicole about the work that they've done in detention centers to go in and actually get people registered and you know, make sure they cast their votes. But it shouldn't be their, it shouldn't be their responsibility. It should be the responsibility of the state government um, to make sure that people who legally have the right to vote are given access. And so I don't know how much more I can say about this other than I hope anyone who believes that uh, Maryland should operate in a democratic way where everybody who legally can vote has the, op you know, has the access and matters um, is given the opportunity. I hope that you will find that this is an important bill to pass and find it favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll take one more um... Uh, witness, and then we'll add, we'll have uh, we'll take questions from our members. Uh, Miss uh, Williams, Crystal Williams, you're here. Yes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Go right. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair uh, Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee. My name is Crystal Williams, and I would like to take the time to uh, properly introduce myself as well to all members of the committee who I have not yet had the chance to meet uh, as the new director of the government relations um, for the Office of the Public Defender. So I'm coming into this position as a line attorney in Baltimore City, where I work with youthful defendant in the youthful defendant unit representing children charged as adults. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the Public Defender's Office to offer testimony in strong support of House Bill 222. Uh, this is an admirable and necessary bill that would ensure that disenfranchised individuals in Maryland have access to our most sacred hallmark to our nation's democracy, and that is making one's voice heard through the power of voting. Of voting. Importantly, this bill would help educate and elevate highly margin marginalized and actively suppressed voice of Black men and women who historically lack in presence and representation at the polls and in the electoral process of obtaining reflective representation across all facets of government. Sadly, Maryland leads the nation in incarcerating young black men. Uh, in 2019, the Justice Policy Institute found that more than 70% of all people in Maryland's prisons, that is double the national average, are black. Uh, as a young law student years ago, I spent a considerable amount of time studying the history of many disenfran disenfranchisement laws across the country and found that there is a direct lineage to many disenfranchisement disenfranchisement laws that plague black and brown communities to this day were rooted in means to suppress racial and economic diversity. Thankfully, great strides are being made with the most uh, egregious of those laws, felony disenfranchisement laws. Now, whether laws can be directly traced to systematic efforts to silence masses of voices or can be seen to have de facto impacts of silencing masses of voices, 
It is up to all of us to make necessary changes to ensure that all voices are represented and heard through our local, state, and federal voting processes. Maryland is taking those steps and critical actions to ensure access to voting for those previously disenfranchised. Uh, thankfully, in 2016, Maryland in particular ended voter disenfranchisement by passing a law that restored the voting rights of formerly incarcerated individuals. This bill would continue the work that has already begun. All eligible voters should be properly educated and provided with appropriate resources and unhindered access to exercise their right to vote. Yet there is broad uh, misunderstanding and misinformation amongst uh, jails and prison officials and especially amongst incarcerated persons themselves regarding their right to vote uh, as an incarcerated person. In Maryland, individuals who are incarcerated pending trial or those who only have been convicted of a misdemeanor are eligible to vote. This bill would address the lack of education and access for those groups of eligible voters, and it would help require uh, Department of Corrections to take an active role in ensuring that this typically disenfranchised group would get the level of education and attention that is necessary to begin to combat years of misinformation. And so I wanna thank Delegate Wilkins uh, for putting forth this bill and to all members who continue to support this critically necessary uh, effort to eliminate barriers for disenfran disenfranchised individuals uh, in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions, Delegate Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, also thank you to Delegate Wilkins for bringing forth the bill. I just had a couple of clarifying questions, um, particularly for those that were out um, registering and, and facilitating, you know, giving assistance to people who were voting. Um, you did speak generally to it being, you know, taxing and, and grueling and, and a tedious process, but could you um, tease out some specific examples of what those challenges and barriers looked like as you attempted to register and or facilitate someone um, voting? Um, well, I can say as the person who actually drove a van throughout the state that um, some facilities weren't really receptive. When I, when I showed up at the door to say, hey, by now, you should have received this packet in the mail. And we're just here following up to make sure that the persons here that's housed here have their voter registration and that they receive ballots. Some of them weren't really that, um, that receptive. And I know that we had called, we emailed, we made personal visits. We went through four or five weeks. We almost wanted to send homing pigeons we had to go through great lengths to make sure that the 756 people that registered to vote out Towson, that they were able to vote. So it was, it was really taxing. I can't even begin to tell you how taxing it was to have to go throughout the entire state just to get that last little bit of insurance, assurance that during the general election that all votes counted. And Delegate Stephanie, on the administrative side, what we found were the challenges were, one, um, the State Board of Election kind of didn't really have a clue in the beginning of a how to, right? So what we found was challenging was that um, Joanne, myself, and uh, Amy at the ACLU had to literally compile a packet for the State Board of Elections that would be distributed. So those packets that went out was developed by us. We had to think about how would individuals who can't read and write receive this packet. We had to come up with things like infographics to include in the packet, right? So that was the one hurdle in terms of kind of getting the, the state board to kind of get a visual of what this could look like. The other thing that we found on the administrative side is when the state board finally at, agreed after meeting after meeting, when they finally agreed that they would do this, they specifically ask out for justice, well, where are the lists? How do we know who is eligible? And so out for justice had to go and contact local uh, local wardens across the state. We contacted seven uh, jurisdictions, uh, Howard County, Baltimore County, um, Carroll County, some other counties, Wamaco County and the like. And we were able to send the State Board of Elections the list of all of those counties in the list of eligible voters. 
These are people pre-trial, not yet convicted of anything, but also misdemeanors, right? Individuals who had misdemeanor convictions. And this is just the law, right? And so that was a huge challenge of putting together those packets for the state board, waiting for the state board to go into procurement to approve the funding for these packets to be distributed, contacting the local jails to find out if they got in them, right? You know, advocating for the state board to include prepaid postage because everybody in our prisons and jails don't have money for that. Um, and then ensuring that the, the, the packets were delivered, reaching out to the local uh, um, boards of elections because remember, the state board of elections kind of give the locals the autonomy to decide the things that they want to do. So some local boards of elections one did not even know the law existed, right? So we had to do additional education to the actual agencies, uh, the local agencies to say, hey, this is the law. But then to ask them, hey, could you at least look out for the mail that's coming from the jail to help us to compile, you know, some data? So there were a lot of challenges. Up to, and lastly, um, the Department of Corrections uh, created a voting policy kind of early September, but like Joanne said, when they were able, when they finally reported what they actually did, everything was inaccurate. And so we could not, we couldn't, we couldn't fathom the fact that you just put out a policy in September and we knew we were having issues with trying to navigate getting people in information. And they just report that we, you know, we did this, we did this great thing, which kind of stopped them from engaging with the advocacy groups who wanted to assist them, right? So that, you know, your senator had to send a letter specifically to the detention center in Baltimore to say, hey, I want you all to, you know, do this thing. Um, so those were just kind of some of the challenges that we don't have enough time to just- I'd also, I'd also just add one more big one. Hey, hey everybody. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna, we can do one last comment, but I think the question was answered though, okay? Just um, one more that I think is important to raise. Okay, so go ahead, go ahead, Joanne. It's one thing to get voting materials inside, the ballot inside, and then we ran into issues getting voter education, nonpartisan voter education materials in there, right? So average everyday voters, you know, outside of the candidates, they've got information on things like ballot measures, right? The League of Women Voters, we were trying to get their guides into these facilities. Every facility wanted to tell us that it was contraband, right? So that was another hurdle as well, getting the ballot into the voter's hand, but also educating that voter on the, on what's actually on their ballot. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. And thank you to all of you for that work that often if you didn't do, there are people who wouldn't have been able to vote. So thank you for all of your, your work. Thank you so much. No, thank you. And is there any, are there any other questions? I don't see any hands up or no one in the chat. Okay, with that said, that concludes the public hearing on this bill. Uh, we'll, next go, we'll go next to our next bill, uh, Delegate Ivy, uh, HB uh, 163. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, colleagues. Uh, for the record, Delegate Julian Ivy presenting House Bill 163. Uh, as introduced, this legislation would transfer the authority uh, to appoint and remove members of the State Board of Elections from the governor to the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. Uh, this reform uh, would decentralize power over our Board of Elections so that no single individual would be able to attack our democratic institutions. Uh, frankly, our democracy is just too precious for us to not be overprotective of it. Uh, these last few weeks and months have really opened all of our eyes just to how fragile we are uh, as a democracy and as a nation, with our capital literally being uh, ransacked by insurrectionists. Uh, so in response, we must review our current practices to be sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to protect our Republic. So I wanna direct you to testimony from Common Cause and represent Maryland. Uh, both pieces make strong suggestions for strengthening this legislation. And I would certainly encourage the committee uh, to consider increasing requirements for members appointed to the board generally. Um, let's think about race, gender, and income diversity requirements being considered uh, as possible amendments, uh, as well as allowing the governor and the two presiding officers to all jointly appoint and remove board members. Um, you know, our state checks when they're sent out, they have two signatures on them. If we're gonna allow individuals to be removed from the board of elections, we should have a check and a balance in place. Uh, our democracy, it should be overprotected. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm. 
I'm sorry. Thank you, Delegate Ivy. Uh, any questions for Delegate Ivy? Seeing none, thank you. I believe we have one speaker on this. HP 177, give me one second. Okay, uh, we have one speaker uh, on this and that'll be Miss, Mr. Ken, Kevin Canali. That's a different bill. Uh, this is Represent Maryland, Ms. Christy Demnowicz. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I don't see it on here. So in the I see it. I see it there, um, Delegate Washington. Um, Ms. Demnowitz, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and Delegate Ivy. Um, just want to reiterate what uh, Delegate Ivy said about this bill. We are favorable with amendments, um, and the amendments are mm -hmm. that. Um, well, first of all, we agree with the, the purpose behind this bill, which is to protect democracy and to make it so that our board of election um, leadership is not, cannot be used as a political mm -hmm. tool. Um, but we think that in order for this to be a really nonpartisan uh, bill, it needs to be a uh, two different branches of government need to have the responsibility, the executive branch and the leg legislative branch. And they are both of the, the both branches that have elected officials within them. Um, so we definitely support this bill, but we would like to see it strength to have the governor and the Senate president and the um, leader, the speaker of the house be the, the, the uh, body that appoints the members of the board. And then additionally, we think that this could be strengthened to add some parity requirements for things like race, gender, income. Um, and most importantly, which may or may not be possible is making sure that people who are appointed to the board understand our elections, understand the history of elections and how they work, because these are very, very important positions and they have a lot of responsibility added to them. So it makes sense that there should be some sort of requirement for um, the knowledge and, and experience and information that people bring to them. And that's all I have to say. I hope you will uh, find this bill favorable with these strengthening amendments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the vice chair for taking over while I had to uh, depart for a little bit. Uh, reminding people who have testified on bills that we're done with uh, that they uh, that they can watch the rest of the hearing on the YouTube station, uh, not from the Zoom. Uh, and, and I do apologize. Were there any questions for Ms. Demnowitz? All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing none, and there were no other people signed up to testify. Um, I, I got here just in time, Delegate Washington, to uh, to manage your bill. So House Bill 206, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Great to see everyone this year. Uh, this is a bill that passed out of out of the Ways and Means Committee uh, last year, uh, 20 to 1. <laughs> and it also passed out of the um, House uh, with a very uh, slim, uh, with an with a overwhelming majority. Uh, Right now, what this bill would do is require Maryland early voting centers to open up at 8 a.m. Uh, during non-general elections. Uh, currently, early voting centers open at 8 a.m. Uh, uh, during presidential general elections, but cannot open up earlier than 10 a.m. for any other election. Um, so this would put this. Uh, so this would put our openings uh, to the same account as we do in our general elections. Um, with that, uh, because we passed this bill with a fair report last year, I asked this committee to pass it with the same. Uh, favorable report as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Very uh, concise testimony, Delegate Washington. Uh, any questions for the Vice Chair? All right. Uh, thank you. Seeing none, uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 206. And uh, closing out our day, Delegate Guyton, House Bill 247. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, it's nice to be back in the Ways and Means Committee. I would like to thank you. I'm Delegate Michelle Guyton, District 42B, and I'd like to thank you for your consideration or reconsideration of House Bill 247. This is a reintroduction of House Bill 142 from the 2020 legislative session in its amended language that passed both this committee and the House unanimously last year. This legislation requires a chief election judge to give voting priority order to citizens who need extra assistance at the polls based on guidelines that will be developed by the State Board of Elections. 
The legislation is intended to encourage those who would be unable to comfortably wait in long lines to participate fully in the political process. It also requires that polling places post visible notices that special assistance is available upon request. I'm very grateful for the energies of the election subcommittee last year for working with me and um, Jared Demarinus, the Board of Elections, to ensure that this bill was acceptable to all parties last session. And I urge this committee and subcommittee to once again pass the legislation which would allow all of our citizens to participate fully in the process. This bill is supported by AARP, Maryland Art, Maryland ADAPT, Maryland Association of Community Services, and many, many members of the disabilities community. I'm going to follow Delia, sorry, Vice Chair Washington's um, model of keeping it brief since there's a reintroduction. I do want to say just one thing because we heard Delegate Bill Hill's bill earlier today. Delegate Hill's bill um, does improve the communication around current practices for accessibility, but it does not improve those practices and they're woefully inadequate to uh, serve the needs of our disabilities community. So that's the big difference between these two bills. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delegate Guyton. Are there any questions for uh, Delegate Guyton? I'm looking around, uh, seeing none. Uh, we're done with the hearing on uh, House Bill 247 and done with our hearing for today. Uh, to members, just a, a few announcements. Uh, really today, to, uh, you know, this week's bill have, a, ha, excuse me, this week's bill hearings has quite a few sponsor only, so that uh, speeds things up a little bit as well. I think today uh, was a little smoother than last Thursday. I like the uh, the new timer system that Sarah was able to figure out and has shared with the other uh, other uh, committees and, and members from the other committees got here a little quicker today. So that uh, was good too. Uh, to remind everyone, uh, keep your camera on as much as possible. And, and I think you may have to, but certainly when you ask questions, uh, you would have to have your camera on. At this point, the only other people who are on our uh, Zoom screen our uh, staff from the committee, staff from the speaker's office, and of course, Jared Demarinus from the uh, uh, Board of Elections, and of course, our superb analyst, uh, Stan Ward. Um, I do believe some subcommittees may be voting this week, so stay tuned for that. Uh, education may be voting after tomorrow's hearing, but you'll hear from the vice chair. Uh, I believe Revenues is voting on Friday, early afternoon, and then we as a committee uh, will likely vote about three o'clock on Friday. Uh, so um, so stay tuned. I have to wait and see how many more subcommittees uh, announce their bill hearings. But as you recall, trying to move uh, the easy bills real quick, get things moving, um, um, get things to the floor. So when we get there, we can do our work very quickly. Uh, are there any announcements from the vice chair or any of the other subcommittee chairs? Uh, and yeah. qu question, oh yes, Delegate Washington, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, we aren't going to meet tomorrow. We're going to meet on Friday. So just to make things clear for everybody, we'll be meeting on Friday. And then from now on, after Friday, we're going to meet every Wednesday after the public hearings. Uh, so I just encourage everybody to do your homework. Uh, yes, please do that. And then everyone, again, with your witnesses, those signing up for the bill, anything you can do to ensure that people realize that they have to sign up two days early which allows us and the staff to put everything together, allows us to make the bill order the day before and get that out there for everyone. And so that whole process uh, allows some staff time and my time to, to do that work so uh, we can make this Zoom world work better and everyone knows when they're expected to come on. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, if there's uh, nothing else, I'll see you all tomorrow. I think we have a briefing, uh, tom is it tomorrow? or the next day. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Delegate Rose for that. So see you tomorrow at our hearing at 1.30 and have a good night, everyone. Take care.